Hi, everybody. My name is John Samankowitz. I'm with Beer Law Center. I've got just a couple of seconds today to tell you a little bit about us. We're one of the sponsors and speakers here at the uh, virtual conference. We're a small law firm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we have devoted our practice to alcohol producers and sellers. Breweries, wineries, meateries, cideries, kombucha, you name it, we've worked on it before. If you have a question, give us a call. We don't charge for initial consult, and if we don't have the answer, we'll help you find somebody who does. You can reach us at 919-335-5291. It's a telephone number if you don't like that. Just drop me an email at john at beerlawcenter.com, J-O-H-N at beerlawcenter.com, or find us on social media at Beer Law Center. We'd love to hear from you and we'll help you grow your business. Have a great day. All right. Good morning, craft beer professionals. Um, my name is Javian. I'm with Lotus Beverage Alliance. And today I'm going to be talking about why you might want to add a distillery to your brewery. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, both the uh, craft beer professionals um, and our sponsors today. And after that, let's get into it. So this talk's called Innovation on Tap, Harnessing Brewstilleries to Adapt and Thrive. So a brewstillery is essentially a brewery and a distillery. And I'm going to talk about today kind of the current state of the market for both uh, breweries uh, and the craft spirits market, uh, craft beer and craft spirits. I'm going to talk about the differences and similarities between brewing and distilling, uh, why it makes sense to add a distillery to your existing uh, brewery business, some of the equipment, uh, safety, and then we'll have a little time for uh, questions and answers. So the current state of the market, uh, craft beer, uh, we've seen a huge boom after the, you know, over the last decade plus, uh, but growth has slowed or stopped. Uh, depending on the, the source you look at, it's completely flat. Um, some people say it's it's just slowed to almost a, a crawl. And some reports I've seen uh, show that it's actually declined year over year from 2022 to 2023. Uh, right now, it's among the most competitive uh, craft drinks. Uh, consumers are drinking less beer, uh, especially younger consumers. Um, but the, the reports I've seen say that they're not necessarily leaving for, you know, specifically for health reasons or to go to a different type of drink. Um, most of them are leaving beer in favor of other alcohol-based drinks. And like I said, younger Gen Z, Gen Alpha, uh, those people are kind of choosing non-alcohol beverages, but overall consumers are choosing just other alcohol-based drinks that aren't beer. Uh, and as we've seen, competition drives margins down because you have to adjust your pricing. Um, also, ingredients, raw ingredients go up in price as competition uh, comes in. And then we've seen you know, as high as 8% inflation, and so that's driving prices up, which gives people less money to spend. And the craft spirits market, uh, the craft spirits market is still growing, both in volume of uh, how much is sold and in the dollar amount that's being sold. Uh, from a craft spirits perspective, you see a higher profit margin um, from your in-house production. So a, um, you know, a bottle of, of whiskey or a, you know, a bottle of gin has a much higher margin than a, a bottle of beer does. And right now, oops, sorry about that. Right now, about 90% of sales in the craft spirits market are coming from medium to large producers. And I think that's very similar to what we were seeing, you know, five to 10 years ago in the craft beer market and the craft beer market has taken a ton of margin from those larger producers. So I think we're in a similar place uh, to where craft beer was a, a few years back. And so it was a, a good opportunity for, you know, both craft distillers and brewers who want to add a craft distillery to take advantage of that. Uh, craft spirits are outpacing basically all non-craft spirit, uh, all craft, non-craft drinks in the U S and globally right now. And one, specific aspect of the craft spirits market, which is ready to drink cocktails or ready to drink drinks in general. Um, it's expected to reach 21.1 billion in the next three years from 1.1 billion last year. So huge, huge market opportunity. And so real quick, I'm going to go over just kind of the basics of, of brewing and then the basics of distilling. So we can talk about some of the, the basic differences, um, you know, brewing, this is, this is dumbed down a little bit, obviously. So brewing, you're going to, you know, mash your grains, 
uh, louder them, which is to separate the, the grains from the liquid. You want to boil that to, to sterilize it and so that when you pitch your yeast, the yeast can outcompete any potential bacteria or, or wild yeast in there. Uh, you pitch your yeast and ferment, and then once it's fermented into beer, uh, you package. <clears throat> this is just a, a fuller you know, kind of in writing overview of that. So, you know, more production, uh, you fine tune that for the desired flavor or the type of beer you want to make. Um, the mouthfeel you want, the color you want, the fermentability you want. Uh, this is precisely temperature controlled so that we get a fermentable wort. Um, the louder, which is optional for distilling. A lot of distillers don't actually um, do this louder phase, um, but it is essential for brewing. Um, we're not sending grains you know, on to be boiled, which would lead to like tannins and off flavors and whatnot. Uh, and then we're gonna boil, which is necessary for most beer types. Uh, the main purpose here is, like I said before, to uh, sanitize the wort so that when we pitch the yeast, the yeast can outcompete and we don't get any off flavors. But it's also to isomerize hops so we get that um, those hop characteristics in our in our wort. But also to drive off uh, DMS if we have a um, you know, if we're doing lagers. Then we chill to pitch temp. This is another thing that um, some distillers do. At least if they don't do it, or if they do do it, they do it a little bit differently than than brewers do. So. They might um, chill it over a longer period of time. Um, they might not chill as much. They're also fermenting generally at a higher temperature uh, than brewers. But for brewers, I keep playing. For brewers, you know, we're controlling that temperature pretty precisely because uh, we want the yeast to be happy to fully ferment out all the sugars that they can ferment, and then to flocculate. Uh, sometimes this is pressure regulated. Uh, and then say low, uh, longer, slower process uh, to keep the yeast happy and to keep off any you know unwanted uh, flavors. And then we move on to packaging, which could be a serving tank, uh, a keg, can, bottle. How are you going to package your product? And then the stilling's uh, slightly different. So we have uh, you're going to mash, and then from the mash they might cool it inside the mash tun. So they have a jacket in here where they're uh, pushing water through to cool the mash to pitching temperature, and they're going to be pitching, you know, quite a bit higher than uh, a brewer would. So they're, you know, potentially in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, using different yeast strains than um, than you would. And they have a highly fermentable wort, and then they're going to move on to fermentation. Once it's fermented, uh, that beer they actually call it a, a wash goes on to the still to be distilled, and then once that's distilled, they they might add some stuff to it, they might not, uh, but then they're gonna package it. And then in a little bit higher detail, like I said, they're producing a highly fermentable wort uh, using kind of different ingredients potentially. So barley, rye, corn, potatoes. They might just use neutral grain spirits, which is a highly neutral like ethanol base. Uh, they might use fruit juices or syrups. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, products that they might use to uh, turn into their mash or their, their wash. And then again, they will chill. Um, they may or may not louder, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's pretty common to see very quick fermentations of two to three days, so much faster turnaround time. Uh, like I mentioned before, they're going to ferment at higher, temp uh, higher temps. They have generally pretty minimal temperature management. They might use just water uh, to chill the fermenter, um, or they might use uh, a heated fermentation vessel to, to if they're not getting up to their, their higher temps, they might heat it to uh, speed that up. And then another big difference is some of them will ferment on grain uh, and some will uh, louder before fermenting, some won't, like we said. And this produces the wash. The wash then goes on to be distilled. And so what's happening in the, in the still is we're separating the ethanol from the rest of the wash, uh, you know, the, the alcohol, the ethanol is what goes on to be packaged later. Um, there's different mashes depending on what kind of product we're starting with. And the dis you know, the mash fermentation and distillation processes uh, are what determine what kind of spirit is made essentially. And then the configuration of the still um, can be different depending on what type of, of spirit they wanna make as well. So you might have a very simple still that just has a, a pot and a, you know, a head and a line arm, 
uh, and a condenser, or they might have something that's more complicated to make a more neutral spirit, which has you know a big uh, 16 plate column or 20 plate column or multiple columns to, to make a more neutral base product. And then um, depending on what kind of still, they may need to distill it again to, to make it you know, a little bit more pure, to get more of the uh, impurities out. And then from there, it goes on to packaging. And so generally with craft spirits or packaging in, in bottles, um, potentially cans if you're making a, a canned cocktail, but slight difference there as well. And so what are the takeaways? Basically, brewing is very similar to, uh, but not exactly the same as distilling. So you might be using different ingredients. You might be using the same ingredients. Uh, the processes you know, on the mass side are very similar, but we're on the brewing side, you know, have a little more control over the process. Um, the equipment's mostly the same, but you do have to have a still for a distillery. Uh, you may also need some additional lab equipment that you may not have for a brewery. Um, different times to go from start to finish, right? The fermentation time is much shorter. Um, so you can produce more product in the same amount of time, uh, different costs to produce. So depending on what kind of ingredients you're starting with, um, you know, that, that cost may go up or down depending if it's a expensive ingredient or not, uh, different sales price, obviously, you know, a nice bottle of whiskey can sell for $80, $100, even more. Uh, versus a bottle of beer is probably not going over about 10 bucks or so. So, um, and then the different floor space and safety requirements. So one thing that we haven't talked about yet, we'll get to on the safety part is that when you have ethanol in your space, um, you become a hazardous location. So you have to take some additional precautions so that that ethanol doesn't ignite or explode. Um, so there are some different safety precautions to, to understand there. And then, so, Basically, you just need to understand the differences, how they'll affect your current brewery and production, and uh, and plan for that. So, why might you want to add a distillery or distillery equipment to your brewery? Uh, one, it's going to unlock a new revenue stream, right? So, beer is is flat or declining, depending on where you look, um, and spirits are on the rise. So, you take advantage of that by adding minimal equipment and uh, diversifying revenue streams. Gives you additional offerings. Um, and then as I mentioned before, there's a higher profit margin um, on spirits than, than beer. So you get higher profit margin from your in-house production. If you are a brew pub or you have a bar where you serve alcohol, now you can use your in-house uh, spirits to make that. And so you have a higher revenue there as well. Uh, you can potentially attract new customers who are spirits lovers and maybe not necessarily beer lovers. You can also, as, as I mentioned before, people are moving from beer to other alcoholic uh, drinks. Um, so you can keep some of those existing customers that have changing preferences. So if you have customers that really like your beer, but they're not drinking as much beer and they're starting to drink more whiskey or gin or craft cocktails or whatever it is, uh, you can keep some of them buying your products instead of buying someone else's product. Um, another big key is a brewery has the majority of the equipment to make a spirit already. So you have the mash tun, you have the fermenters, uh, you have cooling equipment like a glycol chiller. So most of the stuff you already have, you're only adding minimal equipment to basically broaden your horizons and add additional revenue streams. And as I mentioned before, the uh, ready to drink category is is expected to just continue to rise. So you get in front of that, that growth and not be chasing it uh, in a couple of years when you know, if trends continue, that's what most people are drinking. Um, another reason that you might want to add a distillery is that it's uh, a crowded market. You know, brewery growth has slowed. Um, you know, where you look, depending on where you look, it may be on the rise a little bit or flat or, or, or dropping a little bit, but it's slowed nonetheless. And if that trend continues, uh, you're going to want to have another way to, to make profits. Um, breweries need to diversify to appeal to a wider audience. That's something we kind of talked about already. But if you have something for, for everyone, um, not only can, you know, a, a wife who loves beer come in with her husband who likes whiskey and they can both get a drink or vice versa, um, you just keep keep people uh, and their friends and their loved ones coming into your, your space because you have more to offer them. Um, there was a huge volume increase in hard, hard seltzer growth. Uh, in 2019, we saw, you know, almost a 200% growth in hard seltzer. 
Um, and for me, the hard seltzers that actually have spirits in them uh, taste very good, and the ones that are based on malt beverages don't. So you can be on the better tasting side of uh, the hard seltzer growth. And then according to uh, the Brewers Association in 2020, uh, 33% of responding breweries reported that uh, hard cider, salsa, and kombucha and spirits, um, they're producing these to help diversify. So you want to be in that group as well. Um, the Beyond Beer um, survey they did also said that breweries that were producing things that weren't beer uh, increased production two to three times in 2019. Um, while we saw a lot of uh, breweries shrink during that time. And then finally, the Beyond Beer products helped offset the downturn in 2020, where a lot of breweries uh, were struggling during the pandemic. Um, these people that were producing Beyond Beer products as well saw sales increase by about 40%. So uh, when something happens, if you have a diversified portfolio, you're able to better navigate those times. And then finally, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit before as well, but product diversification. So this diversifies your product centers. It means not all of your money is coming from beer. So if something happens to beer, you're not completely out of it. You, you have something to fall back on. So even in ordinary times, being able to adapt and change to markets is critical to business. And I think, you know, we used to think of product diversification as being like, oh, look, I have a hazy, I have a West Coast, I have a juicy, and I have a, a session IPA. So, uh, Expanding beyond just having multiple IPAs or more multiple different kinds of beer, but having truly different uh, product mix. Uh, and then a uh, recent poll of Bruce Stillery's, um said that diversification of income streams was one of the top reasons that they added a brewery to their business. So this is uh, breweries that have already added distilleries. This was the main reason that they did it. Um, and just to show you kind of a couple of examples of companies with a uh, diversified portfolio, we have Rogue out here on the West Coast. They have beer. Uh, they're doing sodas. They have CBD and infused drinks. They have cro craft cocktails, um, you know, presumably using their, their own craft spirits that they make. And so they have lots of different ways to, to make money out there in the market. Um, another good example of this is Treehouse. So Treehouse has beer. They're doing coffee. Um, they're making liqueurs, um, cider, I don't know if their cider is launched yet, but they're doing cider. Um, they're also doing gin and then, um, they're making gin and tonics. Uh, so craft cocktails, uh, again, uh, I would assume using their, their own gin. And, uh, you know, as you probably know, both these companies are doing very well. So, and lastly, good brewers make good beer, or in this case, when we're talking about stilling, they make good wash. So you already have you know, mash production equipment is already in place and you're already controlling your mashes, you know, better than I would say most, most distillers are. So if you're making good beer, you're making a good wash already. Uh, I think brewers tend to use very high quality ingredients um, because we're so concerned with off flavors, having a, a beer with, you know, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, it's more important that uh, no off flavors come across than it is when you have a, you know, 40 percent. Uh, whiskey, it's harder to taste those off flavors. And our temperature control practices in breweries uh, are good as well. Uh, I think a lot of distillers think that they're going to distill out many of their problems. Uh, and, you know, on some level, some of that is true. But for me, it's it's good in, good out, bad in, bad, in, bad out. And I think you're, you know, if you're using the same fermentation practices that you're using for your brewery, you're probably going to make a very high quality uh, spirit as well. And then, uh, as we all know, being a brewer is essentially being a janitor, and we have good uh, sanitation practices uh, on top of that, probably better than many distilleries that I've seen. So equipment-wise, um, you know, I've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but a brewery has the mash-making equipment already. Uh, they have the wash-making equipment, which is a for fermentation, where you have cooling, so the part that you really need to think about adding is a still and then, you know, a couple of pieces of, of lab equipment. Um, and with the still, I'll kind of go over some of the kind of basic parts of the still. Um, you have the pot, which is, you know, where the distillation starts. You'll have a head on top of that, which uh, might have some shape to it. And that shape is just to 
uh, condense anything that's coming up so that um, it gets purer and purer as it comes through the rest of the still. Uh, and then this particular still here goes to a column, um, but you may or may not have a column depending on what spirits you're trying to make. Uh, you may also have a gin basket, which is not shown on, on this still, but uh, if you're making gin, you might put botanicals in a gin basket. Uh, but you can also just uh, macerate them and, and throw them directly in the still as well. Uh, you're going to have a higher extraction, higher flavor if you do it that way versus the gin basket. Gin basket can be a little more subtle, um, you know, a little more delicate uh, spirit. And then you have a condenser, which uh, basically cold water or flows through this and then makes the ethanol vapors condense back into uh, liquid. And then you collect that. Um, you know, another reason you might consider adding distillery is just because, you know, I think we've gone through this quite a bit at this point in this presentation, but there's an increased consumer interest and, um, you can increase the uh, consumer experience. So <clears throat> your place can be a destination for a large, larger target group. Um, you can also do kind of fun things like, let's say you make a whiskey and you want to pair your whiskey with beer and have like a whiskey pairing night. Uh, if you have more products that a customer likes, they're gonna have more loyalty to your brand, um, but also probably more likely to refer people by word of mouth saying, hey, have you been over to this brewery, man? They have an incredible whiskey, plus their beer is incredible. Uh, that will get more people to come in and uh, more outreach potential. So the beer and spirits communities are, there's some crossover, but there's some differences as well. So. There's more people you can reach out to and be involved in the community, different communities, different groups, um, which can lead to different events. So there's, there's lots, of, lots of opportunity there. And so finally, I kind of just want to talk about safety quickly because there are some safety considerations um, with distilling that you don't have with brewing. And so this right here, uh, call this the sombrero of death, obviously, because the, the shape looks kind of like a sombrero. Um, but this is essentially the area in which if you had like a leak or something wasn't attached uh, all the way or, or any al uh, ethanol vapors were just getting into the air. So this, this is the area you need to have clear, basically, um, so that any ethanol vapors that do escape the still uh, aren't ignited. So it's three feet off the floor, 25 feet around the still. Um, at the ground level and then five feet around the still above that that three feet and then any controls or anything like that need to be outside of this uh sombrero of death and that keeps things from from exploding so one consideration that we talked about earlier if you're going to add uh, a distillery is how much space do you have because you do need uh you know based on this you know a pretty good amount of space to add that um, one way to get around this is you can build walls so you could build a three foot pony wall around this and that um that 25 feet can be lessened if there's a wall uh, blocking off that area. Some other safety considerations. Um, if you're gonna get controls, you, you probably want them made by a UL 698 um, shop. Uh, we have a UL 698 shop. And basically this is a, just basically a, um, a place that can make controls for hazardous locations. Um, you're gonna have to abide by the C1 D2 fire code. Um, that's national compliance, and that's basically this right here. Just that you have the still in a uh, specific area so that the ethanol cannot ignite. You also need to think, you know, on the top of this, that if you have lights up here, um, you need to have that five feet between the still and lights, unless those lights are, are rated for, you know, a C1 D2 area, because uh, those could potentially ignite ethanol as well. Um, you also need to think if you're using elements, they need to be explosion proof. Um, same with any pumps or motors, um, those need to be explosion proof. Um, we use also intrinsic barriers, which <clears throat> basically don't allow a uh, high voltage to go through um, to that area where um, there's potential explosions. Um, depending on your, your uh, sorry. <laughs> Depending on your area and what, and what the rules and regulations are, you may or may need to add additional ventilation uh, or an ethanol detection system. Um, I, I don't see this a lot, but some areas are a little more uh, finicky about what they want in a distillery versus a, a brewery. So 
uh, ventilation, ethanol detection systems, and fire suppression may be considerations you need to, to think about. And so what's next? So let's say that all sounds good to you. You're you're ready to, to talk to your local authorities and make sure you can have a distillery and a brewery in the same place. So what, what do you need to figure out? One, you need to talk to somebody locally to determine out your local regulations. Um, you want to find out things like, can you produce uh, spirits and, and beer in the same location? Some places you can, some places you can't. So it depends. It's kind of state by state. Um, you also kind of figure out, can you sell through your current channels? So if you're selling through a distributor, can your distributor also distribute your spirits? If you're self-distributing your beer, can you self-distribute your spirits? There's lots of, you know, as we all know, there's lots of different laws around uh, both distilling and brewing or, and any kind of alcohol that, that can differ, you know, quite a bit from state to state. And then you want to know if you can sell it at your taproom because you might not be able to do that as well. So these are the things you want to figure out. And once you figure that out and make sure that that, that all works for kind of your plan is how you want to launch spirits, then you can think about things like, you know, ordering equipment and, um, you know, maybe hiring a distiller and, and going through that process. And so questions. So this is my contact info. I'm Jabian. So my uh, email is jletlow at lotusbeverlyance.com. You can call me at 503-486-7700. And if you kind of already know that you want to add distilling equipment, you can go to lotusbeverlyance.com and fill out a request for quote. Um, but in terms of questions, let's see if we have any questions from anybody. And if not, then uh, I have some questions that we can uh, kind of look at. <clears throat> So let's see. Does anybody have any questions that we can uh, answer about this? All right. If not, um, there are some things that, that kind of come up a lot. And it's, you know, what if I already have an existing brewery, like what, what do I need at this point? Um, well, typically in a distillery, most distilleries have two stills. They will have a stripping still and then a spirit still. And the, the point of those is one, the stripping still kind of just runs hard and fast. You're kind of basically taking out any impurities as fast as you can. You'll so you run a, a really quick distillation on that. And then you'll have a spirit still on the other hand, which will kind of run slowly, a little more slowly. And the reason you have two is so you're not impacting throughput. So for a brewery, you might want to start with one, especially if you're, you know, not all the way ramped up. Um, so you're going to do a proof of concept with a, uh, maybe a smaller still. And then <clears throat> once you decide, yeah, this is what we want to do. We have our recipes. It's all working. And you might add a start, slightly larger still to, to speed up production and, and do the stripping for you. And then let's see. Another question might be around price. Uh, price really comes down to kind of what size of brew you have. You kind of want to size. Typically, you want to size your, your still to about the size of your mash tun. Um, or half the size of your mash tun. So you might mash, put in a fermenter, and then you have two batches of, of that you can run through the still. Um, or you can just do it one-to-one, -one, um, which is another, another pretty common way to do it. And that's it. Those are probably kind of the, the two most common questions we get. So yeah, like I said, my name is Jabian. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can reach me at uh, this number or this email address. And I appreciate your time and taking the time to watch my presentation. Cheers.